Grundig 2030W, 3D, 1954. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is welcome and appreciated. This was meant to be a lower range luxury radio sold at its time for 269 German marks, which could have corresponded to about half of a monthly wage. This advert appeared in the German Handbook of Radio and Television Wholesalers, 1954 1955, page 25. Here is also a small advert from the magazine Faunk Schau, year 1954. This radio can receive FM stations, but only in the range of 87-100 MHz, medium wave and long wave. Unfortunately, a short wave band is missing, and on the long wave band there is very little that could be received these days. However, what this radio has is a set of three loudspeakers. Hence the 3D added to the name of the radio, which promises to offer an impressive sound. This radio was imported and sold in Italy, and it is interesting to observe that the tax labels for the six tubes have been attached on the internal side of the back panel. This unit shows another interesting detail, a five pins DIN socket, that is not supposed to be part of the original radio, which was added probably in the 1960s or early 70s. Apart from that, and a repaired keyboard button that had to be glued some time in the past, the unit seemed to have received no other visible maintenance. However, the connections of the loudspeakers to the output transformers were wrong, which suggests that an inspection has been made, possibly because the radio was not working anymore, but the plan of repairing it was abandoned. The chassis of the radio was painted with a goldish color that can come off by just cleaning the chassis, even using very mild detergents. Therefore, considering that the chassis of this unit had no sign of rust, probably this goldish paint did not have the function of protecting against it. Under this goldish color appeared a shiny mirror surface that resembles aluminum or tin, on which one could easily solder. Unlike the nice experience of a solderable stainless chassis underneath, there is the frame of the keyboard switch system that is made of regular galvanized iron. Unfortunately, the zinc that was covering the iron developed almost completely into metal whiskers. If interested, there is a page dedicated to the subject in the NASA Electronic Parts and Packaging Program site, with links to many related documents. Ideally, all the chassis should have been cleaned using a dishwasher to get rid of all the zinc particles spread around by broken whiskers, but that could not be done because the thin threads of the RF coils on the board attached to the keyboard switches would not have stood the water jets. Later it was found that the AM sections of the variable capacitor were shorting, maybe in relation to this whiskers problem. After cleaning the chassis, observing that the components were still in good visual shape, a test was made using an isolation transformer and dim bulb tester. However, for precaution, the final amplifier too was removed and the audio signal was collected from the volume potentiometer, listening to it from a signal tracer. The radio was working, but in the M-bands the variable capacitor was shorting. 
Unfortunately, the new variable capacitors of the 1950s had a much narrower space between the blades, and if they endured any kind of small deformation over time, there is very little chance to fix them. Ideally, the capacitor should have been washed before attempting anything else. However, it is firmly anchored to the FM module, therefore, initially the idea was put aside. What follows is described with the sole purpose of explaining that what has been tried is definitely not recommended, except for the washing that, however, did not solve the problem. Initially, the rotor blades were found to be pushed too much towards the front. However, the only available adjustment is in the back, which can only reduce or increase the pressure towards the front. By the way, to access that adjustment, it was necessary to remove the shield of the first IF transformer. Unfortunately, releasing the nut and the screw on the back was not enough because there isn't any pressure from the opposite direction. Therefore, the rotor was removed to find a way to obtain such pressure. The idea was to put a thin spacer before the front bearing. A very bad idea, actually, because such a spacer should have been thinner than one-tenth of a millimeter. The small washer that was used was much thicker than that, and with such new parameters it wasn't even possible to put the rotor back in place. However, after removing the spacer, some residues of hardened superglue were making the wanted backward pressure that could finally be adjusted but it didn't work. Now the backward pressure was too much and there was no way to push the rotor blades in the correct position without blocking the rotor completely. So the glue residues were cleaned and the variable capacitor together with its FM tuner module was removed and washed in the dishwasher. These clips have been taken after the washing procedure and they show how to remove the stator and how to put it back in place. Doing so is definitely not recommended, unless it is really needed for some reason. At this stage, the rotor blades were still shorting with the stator ones, and something else was tried out of desperation. Here the rotor is extracted again, with the purpose of changing the way that the contact brushes are touching it, so that they could pull instead of pushing. This is still not recommended practice, but the result was giving some hope, although still not good enough. The effort of trying a solution for the shorting variable capacitor obliged to remove and then to reinstall the FM tuner. Here are the connections that should be detached on the board located under the keyboard switch. There are a few more wires to take care of connecting the B+, the ground and the antenna, but their destination is not the board under the keyboard switch, and therefore they are easily visible. The four wires that are inserted through the band switch selector needed to be guided making a temporary extension. These clips show the process needed from the point of view of these four wires only. The remaining wires are easily manageable.
Only two screws hold the variable capacitor and consequently the FM tuner in place. The FM reception is still okay. However, all the effort for recovering the variable capacitor for the AM bands was just wasted. At this point, what was the perspective of this restoration? Using the radio only for the FM band, which is not even complete, and maybe for a Bluetooth receiver. That seemed to be a very modest result for a radio like this one. Ignoring the remote possibility of finding an identical variable capacitor and FM tuner set to replace the broken one. Maybe just another different variable capacitor could have been added and used in place of the two broken AM sections of the original one. Not really an easy solution, considering that the two variable capacitors should be driven by the same dial cord and that the output transformer is so close. Ideally, a transistor radio variable capacitor would have fitted well in the narrow space. Unfortunately, they don't have enough capacity, so another old radio variable capacitor would have been used. Maybe moving aside a little bit the output transformer, a relatively small variable capacitor found for the purpose could fit. It is a 540 plus 540 picofarads. But nothing is easy with this radio, the two AM sections of the original variable capacitors are not identical. In the oscillator section, the rotor has 16 blades, while in the antenna section it has 17 blades. According to the original schematics, the oscillator section has a value of 431.5 picofarads, and the antenna section 518.5 picofarads. So here is the adaptation that was planned. Two NP0 surface mount capacitors in series were used to obtain the desired value for the oscillator section. The following clips show how the variable capacitor installation process developed. The output transformer had to be moved slightly to leave enough room for the additional variable capacitor. For the purpose, two brass standoffs were soldered, but before that they had to be prepared. Closing one side with a screw was necessary to avoid filling them completely with solder. Some flux liquid was applied before soldering on the chassis. However, later it was found that using a very hot soldering iron, just applying Vaseline oil for this function was sufficient on this chassis.
the residues of flux were removed, cleaning the area with a detergent. Once the two standoffs were soldered onto the chassis, it was possible to place the output transformer on top of them. For installing the additional variable capacitor, one standoff was soldered, while the other one was inserted in place of a screw. The additional variable capacitor was installed and connected in place of the A in sections of the original one. Also, the extra capacitor in series for the oscillator section was put in place. This is the initial test to see if the oscillator and antenna sections could track reasonably well. It was working. That was a great relief, but then it was time to adapt the dial cord arrangement. It was necessary to accompany the dial cord to the additional variable capacitor drum with an extra pulley. Two standoffs soldered together in a creative way were used to hold the new pulley. It was impossible to obtain a perfect synchronization of the two variable capacitors. Therefore, the new drum needed to be driven only by friction. For this reason, the dial cord was replaced using very strong fishing wire, diameter 0.6 millimeters, relying only on its elasticity without springs. In this test, it is clearly visible that the additional variable capacitor reaches the end of its rotation while the one used for the FM section has still one-third of its movement to complete. See the appendix for additional notes regarding the variable capacitor. After having verified how it was supposed to be the connection of the speakers to the output transformer, a loudspeaker was connected and the final amplifier tube was inserted to test also that section. Under the circumstances, the B-plus was showing an excessive ripple, reflecting in a very loud hum. However, the final amplifier was working enough and the normal restoration could start. The restoration started from the power supply. The first thing to consider is that this radio was made for maximum 220 volts AC, while the mains in Europe provides about 230. Because the tube filaments were receiving a slightly higher voltage than prescribed, three halogen light bulbs were used to drop some voltage and also control initial current surges. The light bulb sockets were installed on a small plastic box, 
also containing two fuse holders. Here is the modified power supply section. To avoid unnecessary dramas, all the primary windings taps for lower input voltages than 220 were isolated and are not selectable anymore. Two fuses with different values were installed, one conforming to the original specification and another one slightly different, for protecting the radio in different circumstances. The selenium bridge rectifier was installed under the chassis in a very inconvenient position. It was removed and replaced with four silicon diodes and a dropping resistor of 150 ohms to get the right B-plus voltage. The filter capacitor can was also removed and replaced with two new electrolytic capacitors mounted on a board under the chassis and the original hole was used for the new three-prong power cable. Later the paper capacitors and the remaining electrolytics were replaced using ceramic disc models where possible. The resistors appeared to be within tolerance and only one of them was replaced because it was burned but even in that condition that resistor was still within tolerance. Later trying to do an initial IF alignment, it was necessary to increase the value of C38 in the first IF can, because otherwise the secondary winding of the AM section in the IF transformer could not be peaked. A surface mount and P0 capacitor was used for the purpose, in parallel, soldering it from under the chassis. C62 is a non-polarized 20 microfarad capacitor with no additional information from the schematics. It is placed between the output transformer and the lateral loudspeakers with the function of driving them only with the higher tones. Because the original capacitor did not appear in good cosmetic condition, it seemed appropriate to replace it. For this purpose, two 47 microfarads electrolytic capacitors in series were used, joining together the negative terminals and connecting them using the two positive terminals. The following clips show the process of inspecting and cleaning the tone controls. The potentiometer R25 is responsible for controlling the bass, while R34 controls the treble. These two potentiometers are not closed which makes cleaning them inside much easier. Inside the knob there is a reference that should fit in a corresponding hole in the potentiometer. There is a very detailed alignment procedure for this radio described in the repair helper, even though this document is written in a technical German language, which makes it difficult to interpret. An initial attempt was done to just follow the original procedure. For the circumstances of the unit under restoration, the dial scale was not aligned. Therefore, only the IF transformers were peaked and the antenna IF trap was tuned. The IEF cans can be opened for an inspection, 
by removing two screws at the bottom and unfolding two flaps. It is important to observe that the ferrite cores of the IF transformers for AM and FM are made for two slightly different tools. The larger insert is for FM, the smaller for AM. The AMIF alignment was done setting the radio for AM reception and measuring the negative voltage at the junction between R19 and R20 compared to ground. According to the repair helper, a 468 kHz AM modulated signal was injected to the first grid of the second EF89 and the cores of the second IF transformer were adjusted for a peak. Then, the modulated signal was injected to the first grid of the first EF89, and the cores of the first IF transformer were adjusted for a peak. As previously mentioned, it was necessary to put an additional capacitor in parallel with C38 to be able to peak the secondary winding. Finally, the signal was injected into the antenna input, and the IF trap was adjusted to get the minimum output signal. For the FMIF alignment, the negative voltage across R23 or C48 should be measured. With the radio set for receiving FM, an AM modulated signal at 10.7 MHz was injected to the first grid of the second EF89 and the primary winding of the second IEF transformer was peaked. The repair helper describes a procedure for adjusting the discriminator that was completely misunderstood, which brought to seek the minimum value at the voltmeter, which corresponded to the complete extraction of the ferrite core. This was clearly wrong. Anyway, the procedure was completed moving the signal to the first grid of the first EF89 and peaking the first IEF transformer. And finally, applying the signal to the EC92 from outside, wrapping a piece of wire around the tube, and adjusting the cores labeled with the letters E and F for a peak. The result, especially for the FM reception, was awful, and the alignment was redone following a visual method, even though only cheap digital equipment was available. Considering that some AM alignment was already done, the revision resumed from where it was left, injecting a signal at the first grid of the first EF89, reading the negative voltage at the same junction between R19 and R20. However, this time, Instead of a voltmeter, a cheap digital oscilloscope was used configured for DC reading. A non-modulated signal generator was used to verify how the IF chain was peaked, noticing that the peak was at about 469 kHz instead of 468. Then, using the sweep function, it was possible to redo the IF alignment trying to get a nicely shaped curve, knowing that the negative peak should be moved slightly towards left. The result was what is visible in this clip, and later also the exact frequency of the peak was verified to be better centered to 468 kHz as prescribed. If the signal generator is not able to provide a synchronization signal to the oscilloscope, the peak frequency should always be verified after the visual alignment. However, it is also true that the visual representation is slightly deformed and shifted, due to the presence of capacitors in the AGC line, whose function is to create a delay in the negative feedback. Therefore, a real-time and accurate representation of the alignment would not be possible even with more expensive equipment. The alignment for FM was repeated, injecting a non-modulated sweeping signal on a piece of wire around the tube, 
EC92, reading the voltage across the capacitor C49 or resistor R23. This function generator is supposed to work only up to 6 MHz, but the sweep function can actually reach up to 42 MHz. Here is the visual result of the alignment of the FM-IF transformers, except the discriminator coil, which in the meantime was kept with the core completely extracted. The shape is not so symmetrical, but one should consider that there is an electrolytic capacitor that interferes. After that, it was necessary to take care of the FM discriminator, for which two matching 150 kilo ohms resistors in series were connected across the electrolytic capacitor, measuring the voltage differential between that middle point and the output of the discriminator. However, in this case, the signal should be AM modulated, and that was obtained with an old signal generator, verifying the output frequency on the function generator, configured to operate like a frequency counter. The alignment was done seeking for the equilibrium in voltages. With the help of the people from the Italian Forum dedicated to radio restoration, I could get an explanation for the procedure described in the repair helper related to the discriminator. While injecting an AM modulated signal, one should adjust the discriminator core, seeking the minimum output from the loudspeaker, while the voltage read across the electrolytic capacitor should reach about 1.5 volts. Before working on the cabinet, it was necessary to remove the loudspeakers. There is a mark on one terminal of each loudspeaker to guide in the correct polarization, which must be kept to get the correct sound. Therefore, the wires have also been marked accordingly. The schematics do not show that the internal antenna is connected to ground using a 50 kilo ohms resistor, taking advantage of the loudspeaker wires. Presumably for the same reasons, all the blocking impedances that are visible in the real implementation are not reported on the schematics. Please notice that, to simplify the connection to the output transformer, a 4-pin automotive spade connector was used. Once the loudspeakers had been removed, it was time to take care of the front panel and loudspeaker grill cloth. Here is visible the removal of the magic eye escutcheon and also of the badge with the model number.
also the speaker wires were removed. Instead of replacing the grill cloth, an attempt was made to clean it using shaving foam. Please notice that the plywood of the speaker panel should not be soaked in water. An hour later the shaving foam residues were removed and this is the result. The small loudspeaker grills on the side of the cabinet were just filthy. However, the brown grill cloth behind them was so fragile that it was impossible to clean the grills without damaging the cloth. Therefore, it was necessary to replace it with some other fabric. Here is the process of removing the old cloth followed by gluing the new fabric using contact adhesive. When the glue was cured, it has been possible to cut the fabric around the grills. To take care of the cabinet, first it is necessary to remove all the decorations. There is a horizontal bar that is held with only two screws accessible from the inside. Then there are two pieces of black plastic that are held by two screws each. The brass frame is held in place by just two nails hidden by a small brass cover. There is then a golden plastic decoration at the bottom that is held by two couples of very small screws. The most difficult thing to remove from this cabinet is this brass looking decoration that is in fact just plastic. To remove the glue it is necessary to penetrate on the side with a precision knife. Otherwise just pulling the decoration out would break it. It is also appropriate to remove the internal antenna wire. It is important to observe that the two original screws have washer spacers for making contact with the aluminum foil that makes the internal dipole and also to avoid penetrating too deeply and passing through the thin wood. This was the condition of the original lacquer on this cabinet. It was chipping, there were important scratches, bumps and other signs. For cleaning the external surface and for smoothening the original lacquer, some acetone was used rubbing with a cloth.
After that, the surface was lightly sanded to make it smooth, but without stripping it completely. Special care had to be put into cleaning the place where the brass frame had later to be inserted. Also the recess for the brass-like plastic decoration had to be cleaned from glue residues. Some stain was applied then, and later the cabinet was sprayed with satin clear lacquer to get an opaque surface. Otherwise, Trying to get a glossy cabinet would have been too complicated. All the decorative pieces needed to be cleaned. The brass-like plastic decoration had residues of glue that needed to be removed. The brass frame was brushed initially with metal polish and fine steel wool, but later also with fine sandpaper. The remaining decoration pieces were cleaned in a similar way, and the following clips should be self-explanatory.
When the lacquer on the cabinet was dry, it was covered with wood wax. Then, the surface close to the recess, where the faux brass decoration should be glued, was protected with masking tape. Some vinylic glue was put inside the recess, cleaning the excesses, and then putting the plastic decoration back in place. More tape was used to hold the decoration down for the time needed for the glue to cure. The faux brass decoration is divided into two pieces that are connected at the right angle junction point. Therefore, the process had to be repeated for the second half of the decoration and, of course, also for the same decoration on the other side of the cabinet. The brass frame was put back without using glue. The gap between the two ends should be put electrically in contact. Originally a copper sheet was used, but that was not salvageable. Therefore a little piece of aluminum foil was used instead. The two ends should be nailed using very thin nails, having a very small and flat head. In this case, the one appearing on the right side has a too thick head, and it was replaced with something more flat but off camera. The two small nails were then covered with a brass junction. It was then the turn of the horizontal brass bar, followed by the loudspeaker front panel. The magic eye escutcheon is made of brass, but it was painted around the hole by the factory, probably to avoid the glare induced by external sources of light. So the escutcheon was masked and painted with a golden paint. To fix the escutcheon to the panel, instead of nails, two brass pushpins are used. In case it were necessary to remove the escutcheon again, that would be easier. There are two more pieces of plastic to be added to the cabinet. They are not specifically decorative, but they are needed to fill the space beside the keyboard switches. Later, the masking tape used for gluing the faux brass decoration was removed. 
The cabinet was waxed in advance, also for the purpose of allowing an easier masking tape removal. Also the plastic decoration that should be put at the bottom of the cabinet was rebuilt and reinstalled. The pieces of brass serve to protect the plastic wear there would be the most intense wear by operating the tone control potentiometers. This plastic decoration is installed on the cabinet using four tiny brass screws of different length. The couple of screws most external are the short ones because there the decoration is thinner. From the factory, the main speaker has a sealing gasket made of foam which by now crumbles. This old gasket was carefully removed and replaced with two layers of adhesive felt. The speaker is held to the front panel via suspension grommets, which seem to be too hard and therefore were replaced with new ones. This speaker does not have a dust cup to protect the voice coil from dust particles. Also considering that some residues of the original sealing gasket could have fallen inside, it seemed appropriate to clean the coil, putting the loudspeaker face down and feeding it with a low power tone that should expel these residues. The three loudspeakers were then installed again in the cabinet. The lateral speakers used some rubber washers that were replaced by cutting small round rubber pieces from an old bicycle inner tube tire. The connection to each speaker was done respecting the original polarization. The keyboard switch of this radio model incorporates the function of powering on and off the radio. This way the radio can be powered on by pressing the button corresponding to the chosen wave band or external audio source and turned off by pressing the OUS button. To obtain this result a regular lever switch was incorporated in the mechanism and mechanically driven by the keyboard levers.
Unfortunately, on many radios that were sharing this method, the power switch was located in a very inconvenient location, usually making the substitution unfeasible. The same happened to this unit that came with a broken switch, which could be replaced only by removing completely all the keyboard switch mechanism, with almost the certainty of damaging very delicate components. Also, the back of the switch body was not accessible. Therefore, it was not even possible to attempt to repair it in place. Usually, the alternative is to fit in a small micro switch, which is what has been done for this restoration. Here are different views of the working mechanism. This radio model includes any M85 Magic Eye tube, which in the unit under restoration was completely worn out. As an alternative, the tube type EM84 could be adapted in place of an EM85, considering that the former would be more affordable, especially in the Chinese version 62. However, during the restoration, an attempt was made to build a very simple LED tuning indicator. Various designs were tried until the simplest configuration emerged. Blue LEDs were used because they have a voltage drop of about 3 volts which is convenient for this type of circuit. Here is the final implementation. The unit under restoration appeared modified, probably in the 1960s, to get an audio output from the radio. The modification was made by drilling the chassis, inserting a 5 pin in connector, and making a corresponding hole also on the back panel. Here is the actual modified schematic diagram. The connection to the audio coming from the end of the IF chain has a very high impedance, more than 1 mega ohm, very likely to avoid perturbing the circuit. Therefore, the output signal would require a significant preamplification. If the pins number 1 and 3 were shorted on the DIN plug, a tape recorder and player could be connected there. If it were recording, it could collect the signal from the end of the IF chain. If it were playing, switching to TB would allow the reproduction from the radio loudspeakers. The tubes were checked for emission using a Heath kit tube checker. The final amplifier, EL84, was OK. The detection tube, EABC80, has different sections to check, requiring slightly different configurations on the tube checker. Unfortunately, the signal diode with anode connected to pin 2 was weak. On this radio model, this might make the FM detection less effective, therefore a substitute tube was required. Here is the replacement used for the EABC-80.
The first EF-89 was okay. The second one was slightly leaky. Even though the leakage disappeared when the tube was sufficiently warm, later it was judged safer to replace the tube. The tube type EC92 is responsible for tuning the FM band and a replacement with a better emission could improve the reception there. Here is the chosen substitute for the EC92. The off switch button was loose and appeared to have been glued on before. To fix the button back to its lever, hot glue was used because it can be adjusted or removed later if necessary. These clips show the process, reusing hot glue leftovers, using the hot air gun just above the glue melting temperature to avoid damaging the plastic. At full volume, the radio showed some important hum, mostly not related to any residual ripple from the B+. In fact, turning off the radio from the power switch, the hum continued to be audible until there was still some energy available. The hum was not caused by the deviation of the input power line described earlier, because connecting the power cord directly to the power transformer and grounding the other internal wiring including the power switch. The hum was still very loud. The hum appeared to be introduced by the bass tone control filter. Every connection in that area was shielded using RG174 cable, with no perceivable improvement. Also the wire used to connect the power transformer to the power switch and to the input power cord was shielded using aluminum foil. Also this did not show an improvement. Only adding a 150 kilo ohms resistor at the junction between C50 C49 and the ground some reduction of the noise was distinguishable. Because it was important to keep the radio silent when selecting the pickup input also a 100 kilo ohms resistor was put in parallel with it. The dial glass was scanned for reference and it is available in better resolution in the written documentation that comes along with this video. On the dial glass there are the level indicators for bass and treble that increase and decrease in opposite directions. The following clips show the process of reinstalling the red plastic indicators for bass and treble, starting from their special springs. Apparently, from the factory, the two cords pulling the indicators were installed too short. Luckily, it was possible to extend them by another centimeter.
Here is the result. While the two tone potentiometers are rotated in the same direction to increase or decrease their level, the indicators move instead in opposite directions. After resolving the installation of the tone indicators, the tuning indicator nylon retainer was installed. There is also a spring keeping the nylon wires in tension, but that was installed off camera. There is less than one millimeter between the additional variable capacitor drum and the dial panel. Everything fits perfectly and that was luck. The dial glass must be held, separating it from the metal parts with rubber. While the original pieces of rubber were consumed or too hard, some new rubber was used cutting the pieces from an old bicycle inner tube. Here is the result of the movement of the tone indicators on the dial glass. This radio model was designed with two audio inputs selectable from the front keyboard switch, one for the pickup, the other for a tape player. It seemed appropriate to add a Bluetooth module connected to the pickup input considering that the other one was already associated with the additional DIN socket. An old Bluetooth loudspeaker that lost the battery was reused for the purpose. The module could be installed on top of another board where the power supply circuit could be added. This is the first attempt for the power supply arrangement, converting the AC heater voltage into 5 volts DC. However, this way there are two important issues. There is no guarantee that the rectified voltage could be high enough to let the regulation to be effective, and there is a shared ground between the AC input and the Bluetooth module. The Bluetooth device is connected successfully. The result was a loud hum noise, definitely unacceptable. The alternative was to use an independent source of power or to insert an isolated DC to DC converter. The latter is the option that was chosen. Finally, the result was satisfactory. The Bluetooth device is connected successfully. To make sure that the Bluetooth module could be easily separable from the chassis, like for the loudspeakers, another 4-pin automotive spade connector was used. A sort of bracket was created to accommodate the switch that powers on the module. It is important to be able to turn off the Bluetooth module otherwise, when not used it would make noise perceivable while tuning to an AM station. The module was installed in the cabinet, at the top, over the surface of the FM dipole antenna. Four short screws were partly inserted, without going through the thin cabinet wood. The head of the screws was tinted, and short pieces of wire were soldered on top of them. The module board was insulated using Captain Tape, to avoid the risk of touching the conductive surface of the antenna underneath. The board was then installed on top of the four screws, letting the short pieces of wire get through the holes on the corners of the board, bending the wires to hold it in place. The switch bracket was located in a position that would be accessible behind the cabinet, also when the back panel is in place. There are at least three schematic diagrams for this radio model, but they all appear to be consistent with one another. Those that are shown here have been partly edited.
This diagram also includes all the modifications described earlier in this video. As usual, these diagrams can be found with better resolution in the written documentation that accompanies these videos. Analyzing the schematics, it might be interesting to observe that the FM tuner does not have a preamplifier section, and only one tried oscillates and mixes, producing the intermediate frequency at 10.7 MHz. However, maybe more interestingly, when one AM band is selected, the same tried contained in the FM tuner becomes the AM oscillator. In this case, the mixer tube is the first EF89. In the audio frequency section, one might notice that there are two audio negative feedbacks from the final audio transformer. The one on top appears to subtract only the treble tones from the input grid of the final amplifier tube. R34, which is responsible for controlling the final treble effect, is used to select how much of the treble tone negative feedback should be used. On the lower side, there is what seems to be a more general purpose audio negative feedback, with the exception that if an AM band is selected, then the treble component of the feedback is not subtracted, sending it to ground instead, which means that for the AM bands, the audio frequency section compensates for the narrow bandwidth with more treble tones. Like other Grundig radios of that time, the serial number is visible through a hole on the back panel. These original labels by now are completely rotten, and it is nice to reproduce them, especially if the serial number is still readable. For the sake of a conservative restoration, it is important to glue the reproduced label on the same place so that it remains possible to read the number through the back panel. This is the long casualty list of this restoration. The discarded parts are saved like for all the other projects of this series. Here is a final view under the chassis after the restoration. the area under the keyboard switch deserves a better detailed view. Before putting the chassis back in the cabinet, it is necessary to put the grommet spacers. They should be glued on the cabinet or on the chassis, otherwise they would become unmanageable. However, one of the four spacers should wait because it must be wrapped with some metal sheet to make contact with the shield attached on the bottom of the cabinet. The cabinet should also be prepared with some brown of black adhesive felt, which will be necessary to fill the gap between the dial glass and the dial frame of the cabinet. The reason for this is that it might not be possible to push the chassis all the way to the front, because otherwise the keyboard switch mechanism could be jammed. The board containing the solid-state magic eye replacement was insulated using some transparent heat shrink pipe. Therefore, it could be installed in the same way that it was the original tube. Finally, the loudspeakers and the Bluetooth board were connected. It is not shown in these clips, but obviously, the chassis was fixed to the bottom of the cabinet with four screws. If the grommet spacers are relatively soft, the tightness of the screws should be adapted so 
that the tone control knobs could be operated correctly without brushing the cabinet. Finally, everything is ready. The test is done in the evening. Using an indoor loop antenna connected to the AM input and the internal FM antenna disconnected because it would collect static noise otherwise. The test starts with the long wave band. One station can be received surprisingly well in this band. The AM variable capacitor finishes its rotation when the dial pointer reaches about two-thirds of its movement. Medium wave band. FM, the antenna configuration is not changed. Mariani di Roma. Ed è tutto.
cretini di natura più politica e, e... Frigorifero combinato Bosch Pickup input is selected and the Bluetooth module is turned on from the back of the cabinet. The Bluetooth device is ready to pair. The Bluetooth device is connected successfully. The original variable capacitor of this unit has all the rotor blades pushed towards the front, which therefore are brushing the stators for the two AM sections. Because the FM sections of the variable capacitor were still fully functional, it was judged safer to repair the AM function of the radio by putting an additional variable capacitor alongside the original one. However, theoretically, it should be possible to desolder the stator blades and resolder them in the correct position, temporarily putting some space or material between the rotor and stator blades. Alternatively, if the body of the variable capacitor had been deformed by too much force applied at the back of the rotor shaft, theoretically, it might be possible to push the front of the body back by using a clamp or a bench vise. Obviously, while doing so, the sphere at the back of the shaft should be released, and the degree of force to be applied with the clamp or vise should be very cautiously determined. As for the variable capacitor of this radio, which has a body made of a cast alloy, using any kind of pressure on it would very likely destroy it. Therefore, maybe, the only chance to repair the one of this unit would have been resoldering the stator blades. I didn't know of these two possibilities, and I reached a solution that still satisfies me in comparison to the risk of worse damage, but that would not be acceptable for other antique radio restorers. Therefore, I do not mean to promote the method that I used during this restoration, but only to document my process.